This learning module will cover physical, health, and related low incidence disabilities. There are many different types of physical and health disabilities. Each one, however, can affect the educational functioning of the individual, requiring the need for special education or related services. IDEA provides definitions for physical and health disabilities, including orthopedic impairment, other health impairment, traumatic brain injury, multiple disabilities, and deaf blindness. While these categories may represent disabilities with a variety of causes and characteristics, in order to receive services, there must be an adverse effect on educational performance. The following lessons within this module will cover orthopedic impairments, other health impairments, traumatic brain injury, multiple and severe disabilities, including deaf blindness, and instructional strategies. Orthopedic impairment means a severe orthopedic impairment that adversely affects a child's educational performance. The term includes impairments caused by congenital anomaly, disease, and other causes. Examples of congenital anomaly include clubfoot or absence of a limb. Examples of disease include polyomyelitis or bone tuberculosis, which result in an orthopedic or physical impairment. Examples of other causes include cerebral palsy, amputations, and fractures or burns that cause contractures. The term orthopedic impairment is synonymous with the word physical disability. Individuals with orthopedic impairments have difficulty operating part or all of their bodies as would be expected. Within the area of orthopedic impairment, there are many different terms used to describe different conditions along with different ways to classify the condition. One way of classifying orthopedic impairments is by cause. Causes of orthopedic impairment can include congenital anomalies, disease, and other causes. Congenital anomalies mean atypical physical development at birth and include impairments such as clubfoot. This is a birth defect where the feet are turned inward Without treatment, people with clubfoot appear to walk on the sides of their feet or ankles. Clubfoot can be bilateral or it can be unilateral and just affect one foot. Orthopedic impairments can also be caused by disease. Polio and bone tuberculosis are two examples of diseases that can cause orthopedic impairment. With advances in medicine, there are immunizations and treatments available for both diseases and early prevention and treatment is key. However, if the conditions go untreated for too long, impairments will occur. Orthopedic impairments can also result from other causes such as cerebral palsy or CP. This type is a sort of catch-all because the cause is simply unknown or cannot be pinpointed. Cerebral palsy or CP can result from a range of causes such as anoxia or lack of oxygen at birth or during the birthing process. However, CP can also be caused by inherited conditions. Another common way to classify orthopedic impairments is through a topographical classification system. Some introduction to special education textbooks refer to this concept when classifying cerebral palsy. However, it is relevant when classifying any orthopedic or physical impairment. Here, the focus is on the specific body location or movement that is impaired. Monoplegia means one limb is affected. Paraplegia means the legs only are affected. Hemiplegia means one half of the body or one side of the body is affected. Triplegia refers to three limbs, although it is not included on this picture and quadriplegia refers to impairment in all four limbs. Orthopedic impairments can also be characterized by neuromotor impairments, degenerative disease, and orthopedic and musculoskeletal disorders. Neuromotor impairments consist of abnormality of or damage to the brain, spinal cord, or nerves that send impulses to the muscles of the body. This often results in complex motor problems. Cerebral palsy and spina bifida are two neuromotor impairments. Cerebral palsy refers to several non-progressive disorders of voluntary movement or posture that are caused by malfunction of or damage to the developing brain that occurs before or during birth or within the first few years of life. 
Cerebral palsy has many etiologies or causes, such as teratogenic, prematurity, complications during pregnancy and delivery, acquired causes, and genetic syndromes. Cerebral palsy can be classified by type and topography. Spastic cerebral palsy is characterized by very tight muscles occurring in one or more muscle groups. Athetoid cerebral palsy involves movements that are contorted, abnormal, and purposeless. Ataxic cerebral palsy is characterized by poor balance and equilibrium in addition to uncoordinated voluntary movement. Mixed type involves a combination of types, such as spastic and athetoid. Spina bifida occurs when there is a failure of the neural tube to completely close during fetal development. During the first 28 days of pregnancy, special embryo cells form a closed tube that will become the brain and spinal cord. When this process is interrupted and the tube doesn't close completely, a neural tube defect occurs. There are four types of spina bifida, and the milder forms rarely cause impairments or symptoms. The mildest form, spina bifida occulta, involves malformation in one or more vertebra and rarely causes impairment or symptoms. Closed neural tube deficits occur when the spinal cord has a malformation of fat, bone, or meninges. With this type, there is also few to no symptoms, but may cause urinary or bowel dysfunction. Meningocele spina bifida occurs when spinal fluid and meninges protrude through an abnormal vertebra opening, but no neural elements are involved. With this type, there can be a range from no symptoms to paralysis. In its most severe form, myelomeningocele, the baby is born with a sac on his or her back containing part of the spinal cord. This type of spina bifida is called myelomeningocele. Children with spina bifida are also at risk for hydrocephalus, or a buildup of spinal fluid in the brain. Spina bifida is a condition that occurs early in the pregnancy and affects the vertebra or backbones and sometimes the spinal cord. 70% of spina bifida cases are preventable by taking adequate amounts of folic acid during pregnancy. The availability of these prenatal vitamins has greatly reduced the incidence of spina bifida in developed countries. Folic acid is a B vitamin that helps build healthy cells. During periods of rapid growth, such as pregnancy and fetal development, the body's requirement for this vitamin increases. Research has shown that if all women who could possibly become pregnant were to take a multivitamin with folic acid, the risk of spina bifida could be reduced by up to 70%. Degenerative diseases affect motor movement, and individuals with these diseases will need increasingly more complex adaptations and assistive technology over time. Many Introduction to Special Education textbooks talk about Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is one of the most severe forms of muscular dystrophy. This disease is marked by progressive muscle weakness, which leads to death between the teen and 20 years. It is important to remember that this disease causes a weakening in the muscles, not the mind. Unless there is some other impairment, a student with muscular dystrophy will not need support to learn academic material. There are nine other major types of muscular dystrophy that cause progressive weakness. Students with orthopedic and musculoskeletal disorders vary greatly in their ability. Some conditions result in severe physical limitations. However, students do not usually experience cognitive, learning, perceptual, language, or sensory issues to the extent found in students with neuromotor impairments. Many books talk about juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and limb deficiency. However, there can be other orthopedic and musculoskeletal disorders that lead to orthopedic impairments. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic arthritic condition affecting the joints that occurs before 16 years of age. Symptoms typically include joint stiffness after immobility, pain with joint movement, limitations in joint motion, and in some cases fever. Children with JRA may go into remission or the disease can progress and cause permanent deformity of the joints. 
Limb deficiencies include skeletal abnormalities in which partial or total loss of a limb occurs as a result of birth defects or accidents. Students are typically fitted with prosthetic devices and may need support and modifications to effectively use the device and interact with the environment. Take a minute to look over this table and review some of the conditions we have talked about so far. Regardless of the cause of the condition or the impact on the body, children need access to people with expertise in physical disabilities, including physical therapists and occupational therapists. PTs and OTs should work together through a transdisciplinary approach and engage in role release with educators and other school professionals. That is, they should teach others who work with a child how to position and practice activities with the child so that the child is not only receiving benefit when they're in therapy, but throughout their day. One of the most important things a PT should do is educate others about how to position a child. Positioning is very important. If a child is not positioned correctly, stress and sores on certain muscles and parts of the body can occur. If poor position becomes a habit, it can weaken the body and limit the body's flexibility putting the child in a great deal of pain. So positioning is a very critical thing with children with more severe physical disabilities. Look at this picture and decide whether this child is in a good position or not. If you answered that this is a bad example of positioning, you are absolutely right. The child is leaning way too far to one side. Harnesses and or wedges should be put in place to help the child sit upright. Now take a look at this picture. Do you think this is a good example or a bad example? If you guessed it was a good example, you are correct. This is a good example because the child is stretched out and they are all doing an activity in the middle of the table. The child can clearly see and interact with the activity. Here is the last one. Do you think this is a good example of positioning or not? If you answered yes, it is a good example, you're right. The little girl in the red top is able to see the little boy. Positioning doesn't always have to involve wedges or other inanimate objects. If the child is small, it may be most appropriate for an adult to provide the proper position. Most children with physical disabilities use an orthotic of some sort. An orthotic is an apparatus that is used to support, align, prevent, or correct physical irregularities. Orthotics should be fitted and developed by a medical professional, but teachers and educators need to understand how they work and what purposes they are serving. Good orthotics can improve the functioning of the child and it will prevent additional problems. Orthotics also relieve pain by limiting motion or weight bearing and can also protect weak musculoskeletal segments. There are a number of educational implications for students with orthopedic impairments. These include implications for teaching, procedures, environment, and technology. Let's start with teaching implications with regard to instructional content. First, students should have access to the general education curriculum. Many students, especially those with physical health disabilities, will not have cognitive problems. It is important to use concepts of Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, in planning. Also, consider using learning strategies study skills, and other approaches that increase comprehension, storage, and retrieval of information. It will likely be important to consider assistive technology. Furthermore, we should consider incorporating content on how to manage the condition. 
consider life skills, self-determination, and self-esteem. We should also determine whether social skills training needs to be included. Lastly, support planning for transition may also be an area of consideration. With respect to procedures, developing individualized health care plans will be important so that there is a plan of action in the event of an emergency. Consider using positive reinforcement, prompting, corrective feedback, and using behavioral contracts with students who need behavioral support. Teach social skills directly if needed. We should also consider whether strategies should be developed to support cognitive and memory skills or for understanding social cues and situations. Keep parents in mind when planning and implementing instructions and keep communication open and positive. It may also be important to teach life skills using everyday materials and activities. Teach other students in the class about the conditions of the peers with disabilities. And lastly, because of extended leaves from school, it may be important to consider using distance learning. Environmental implications include providing a continuum of services when planning placements and supports for students. Strategically plan the classroom environment to avoid physical barriers and encourage mobility. And also make sure materials and activities are all accessible. Technology implications include considering the use of adaptive equipment and assistive technology. It is important to start by assessing whether instructional technology can support student learning, whether through physical comfort, communication, or direct learning. We should also assess the best way to acquire the needed technology and ensure students know how to use their adaptive equipment or assistive technology. Hi, I'm Charlotte and I'm Jared's mom. Jared is an amazing young man. He has a great sense of humor. He loves spending time on the computer and interacting with people around the world and also at us as a family at home. Jared was born with cerebral palsy and it affects him physically, but mentally and intellectually, he's very smart. Jared uses a sip and puff to access his computer. The sip and puff sends a signal to Jared's environmental control unit on his wheelchair, which sends a signal to the TASH switch, which sends a signal to the IntelliKey switch. The IntelliSwitch sends a wireless signal to Jared's computer that controls a software program called SwitchXS. SwitchXS allows Jared to do anything on his computer by choosing options from a pop-up menu that scans through several choices. When he gets to the option he wants, he then uses his sip and puff to make the selection. He can type, control the mouse, and do anything on his computer. When Jared was in elementary school, we started working with the staff at the school to find technology that would help make him successful 
and also provide a recreational outlet for him in the computer field. Um, Jared's technology has changed over time. When Jared was in grade school, he used the leaf switch to access the computer. Um, then we changed when he was in high school to a jelly bean switch, which he would access by um, hitting with his head. And now he uses the sip and puff, which has been the best um, for accuracy for him. Because of his drive to do well, he's doing, able to do what he is today. Uh, yay.